this webinar is going to be about the senses of the donkey. I don't intend it to be a complete encyclopedia of every single possible factor that's involved in the senses of, of equines. And the reason for that is twofold. One, actually, we're not entirely sure in some cases how they perceive the world. The research is ongoing and therefore there are conflicting pieces of information. And secondly, uh, if we're really honest, there is very, very little about donkeys when it comes to their senses, how they perceive the world. So we are taking information from the horse world, how that works, uh, how horses perceive the world. There are a couple of differences, uh, like with the eye that I'll just mention to you briefly. The idea is not to give you every single factor. The idea is to give you a feel of how your donkey perceives the world. And more importantly, what that means for you in your interactions and your training. And if we want to be more donkey centered, then it really is about understanding our animal's perception and thinking with their brains. So I'm gonna go through each of the senses show you a few uh, ideas about how they might perceive the world. Some of them will be familiar to you, fantastic. Others may not. And, and then a few ideas of how that's going to affect how you might train, um, how you might interact with your donkeys. Uh, I strongly suggest you have a pen and paper um, because when we get to each section, we kind of go, how does this affect what, how you train? Then there's quite a few uh, key points in there you might want to scribble down. Um, of course, you can just wait for the, the replay and go and check it out there. But if you want to capture it now, I think there's some good things in there. I've got some links to some other resources that we've got that would be useful for many donkey owners. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to share uh, the screen. So hopefully you can now see um, our little webinar screen here and our title. So the key thing is I want you to think like a donkey by understanding how they experience the world, but it's about becoming a more donkey-centered trainer uh, by thinking with their brain. Now, the key factor about all the senses for any equine, for any animal, is that they have evolved to keep the animal alive and help them to reproduce. And so when we're looking at these donkeys and everything that they are, how they perceive the world has advantages for them in the 60 million years of evolution that they have uh, undergone. And we'll see that very clearly with the eyes. It becomes um, very evident that their eyesight is designed to keep them alive for the way that they live. And that applies to their hearing, their sense of smell, taste, uh, and feel as well. And we'll just link those in as we go along as well, so you can see why those donkeys might uh, be like they are. I did just want to pick up on this paper, um, which talks about there's some significant differences um, in the eye of the donkey um, compared to horses. Uh, the, donkey progress, progress, the donkeys possess a smaller eyeball, sunken um, in, it, you know, we all know that donkeys have that heavier eyebrow with that thicker hair. Um, weight and age have a proven effect on lens size. Elderly donkeys and those between 100 and 200 kilos showing a larger lens. So, you know, immediately that indicates that eyesight changes through age as it would do with humans. Um, if I can just flip back here, you know, I thought these pictures, this classic brow of the donkeys, purely my own theory, no evidence whatsoever for this. But when you start to think, why does that brow seem heavier? And I, I often wonder, is it because the evolution of our donkeys are in a very hot, sunny environment in North Africa? 
and actually having a slightly heavier brow shaded the eye more and as we'll see as we go through gave better vision no evidence for that just a thought um, but it's clearly there are some differences other than that we're going to take the science that we have on horses and work through it we do know that equines um, have one of the largest eyes of any mammal land mammal uh, any mammal compared to their size so even things like a bowhead whale in comparison to size um, the equine eye is bigger and that begins to give us an idea of how important eyesight is to our horses donkeys and mules so we know these are common things panoramic view um, almost complete vision all the way around the animal apart from some blind spots about 20 degrees behind the animal um, they have in front of their head a blind spot also that projects out in front um, they have some binocular uh, vision which extends down in a cone shape from their nose really so they're looking down so that they can see what they're grazing in focus and obviously um, are able to gauge distances better with that binocular vision we'll talk about that more in a, in a moment um, but relatively the blind spots don't really matter too much because the animal can move its head and that blind spot behind disappears obviously evolutionarily they don't have many predators from above so therefore they don't have a huge amount of vision up into the sky no need for that down onto the ground and as we'll see uh, to the horizon really important for equines this binocular vision so their eyes have monocular vision all the way around the side as you can imagine uh, but in front there is a crossover which allows um, some binocular vision in front and down towards the ground that's important for gauging distance in front of them and for seeing immediately what they're eating however we do know things like for horses as they approach a jump an obstacle because of the position of their eyes depending on how their head is the jump will actually disappear before about six to eight feet before they get there so if they've got their head up they can see it a long way they can see it much closer if they've had their head pulled down and into a shape because they've got a bit on they can't actually see that jump they're jumping from memory uh, so immediately you know control of the head where head position affects your animal's ability to see in front of it and to clearly establish things like depth we have very good depth perception if you hold your hands up at, at full length you can tell which finger is closer to you by about a millimeter uh, easy for us to do generally equine's depth perception isn't so good in terms of their eyes but what we do know is that they use lots of other um, stimulus and, and uh, clues to actually allow them to see uh, how deep something is shades shadows color that sort of stuff all plays into their ability to to guess whether how deep something is and how shallow it is um, and they also have this image magnification which is uh, considered to be about 50 percent greater than human beings so they're seeing things bigger and i've got a couple of pictures that i'm going to show you of some approximations of what it might be like to be uh, an equine and, and what they see with their eyes so i wanted to ask you uh, first off can donkeys see in uh, color so let's have a little look at can they see in color yeah they have this limited color vision um and the discrimination what does that look like oh sorry let's go the right way here uh what does that look like so here we've got the limited um horse color vision and the three color receptors in the human eye um, that give us our color vision again it seems to be science is beginning to really show that possibly they don't see red although there is some 
research that suggests other colors may not be clearly seen. So uh, essentially, let's presume we've taken out the red. It's not that they don't see anything, they just see the shades. And, and it's the same for dogs. Um, and so you can begin to see why if you have a green ball on grass, it's very difficult for a dog to find it. The best color toy for a dog is a kind of a purple indigo color because it contrasts brilliantly with the green uh, colors. And it's the same for horses and donkeys and mules. They, they have this color vision. They only have two color receptors in their eyes. Um, animals vary. Um, we, the great apes, um, one of the new world monkeys, howler monkeys have three color vision um, receptors. Things like chameleons, um, they have 12 color receptors in their eyes. They must um, really see very vivid colors, but they want to change color to match their environment. So it would make sense that they could. This is a simple uh, color blindness test, and about 2% of uh, people are color blind. And it's thought that horses and donkeys couldn't see the brown circle on this green dot. They could see the green circle down here on the gray, but the brown one would fade in and they would not be able to visualize it. And that's a simple test that they do for people which um, you can find online and find out if you're colorblind or not. Um, what does it really mean? And it's very difficult to understand what, what colorblindness means if you, you're not colorblind. A couple of quick stories to give you an idea and feel of it because it's so important. Um, I um, was working in Australia a number of years ago and um, a lorry driver said to me, he's red colorblind. Um, which worried me a little bit because of the traffic lights. He said it was fine because although he couldn't see the, the red lights, uh, he knew if it was amber or green what to do. And if he couldn't see any lights at all, it would be uh, red and he would stop. But he would run over people's warning triangles, the red ones on the side of the road because he couldn't see them. You know, he, he mistook his horse, uh, a strawberry roan pony, in the shade and shadows of some trees uh, for a white, its tail was white and blowing around and flashing against the flies. He thought it was a plastic bag blowing around because he couldn't see the rest of the horse in, in the shadows. Um, I have a colleague uh, at the Donkey Sanctuary who was red, um, green, colorblind, and he said on a, on a bright sunny day, if he stopped at a junction and there was dark trees in a lane over the road and a red car was coming up the road, it's quite hard to see. That worries me a little bit. I offer to drive from then on. But the point being, unless you're colorblind, it's quite difficult to understand what it would be like to not have that in your world. Um, what does it look like? We've also got a visual streak. Now, human beings, we have a, a, a cluster of very good um, vision in the center of our eye, very dense sense of, set of receptors and it allows us to focus um, on a particular spot. So here's a trailer. We would focus just here. The peripheral vision is round the edge and it's slightly blurred. To give you some sort of example of, of what a horse might be saying, and it's not perfect, but it gives you an idea of the difference. Horses have a visual streak. So your equines have a streak of increased density of um, receptor cells from the back of their eye to the front, which means there's a streak uh, which is in focus. Above and below is more peripheral vision. Now this makes complete sense if you're an equine because when you're grazing, it means you can keep your horizon around you in focus. You can see if there are any predators approaching you. And that is a massive um, evolutionary advantage. And it looks a bit like this. You can see that the picture they've taken out the red uh, pigment and the bottom of the picture is a bit blurred. The top of the picture is a bit blurred. Uh, the center is more in focus. Immediately, it isn't far enough because the screen's not wide enough to show you how far it would go around. I'll try and show you that in a moment. But they're looking at something completely different. We are focused on this. And the same thing when they approach a jump or an obstacle we see that jump very clearly we're focusing on it they see the middle the jump the top whatever they're looking at the bottom's fuzzy above it's fuzzy they're seeing everything out to the side and it's very distracting so this visual streak really important for them and it allows them to take in a lot of information make sure they're not crept up on um, 
So again, here's a skyline picture from a city. In the middle, the human being would see something that's in focus. Around the edges, again, it's blurred peripheral vision. However, this is the equine visual field from just one eye. And you can see this piece over here on the right hand side is, is what we're, the human is seeing. And it goes all the way around to the back here to this gentleman who's taking the picture from behind the animal of what they're looking at. So all of this information is being poured into the equine brain. But this is only one eye. This also laps over and it goes all the way around the other side as well. Huge amount of information going into their brain that they're picking up on, which is, explains things like we're walking along with our lovely human field of vision. We see the animal spook, it moves, it does something. We're kind of like, what, what, can't see anything. By the time we turn around, whatever the donkey had seen has stopped moving, it's flown away, it's not there. And we're like, what would you do that for? They are taking in so much information. It shows why they're so easily distracted. It shows why you have to do so much training to be able to get them to deal with new situations. So what else do we know about the equine eye? Bright light affects uh, better in low light. So they have a problem in really bright light. Middle of the day, bright, sunny, whether it washes out some of the color, partly because of their night vision, which we'll talk about in a moment, but because of the way they perceive color. And so they are better in overcast light. You know, equines evolve really to do most of their grazing and browsing just before dawn and after dawn, just before twilight and um, after sort of dusk. In the middle of the day, their natural rhythm is to sleep, is to rest, is to get out of the heat, is, is to take it easy. So they don't have great vision in bright light. It washes out colors and they see it differently. Not only that, but there's a massive effect on their ability to swap between light and dark. So um, they look, we look at something, and if, it, if we get shut into a dark room, within 30 seconds, our eyesight is adapted to that dark as best we can. For an equine, it can take 20 to 30 minutes for their eye to fully adjust between light and dark. And that has some massive um, implications for when we get them out of a stable, into a stable, when we're loading, when we're doing things with them. This difference between light and shade, massive. So it takes them a while. Their eye isn't designed to close at the same rate because they've evolved in open spaces where it got dark slowly and it got light slowly. Um, and so it could adjust over more time. Now, one of the things that we know about equines is that essentially their ability to see things in focus, um, their visual acuity, things like that are actually worse than humans. So they are very primed for movement and they see things along that um, visual streak uh, reasonably well, but close up, they tend not to have as good vision as we do, um, but they do have brilliant night vision compared to us. Our night vision is pretty poor. Um, equines have more uh, rods in their eye, which is the bit that does the night vision. Uh, we have the, the rods as well. Um, and their peripheral vision around rods is much better um, than uh, ours. So they, it's not the same quality. It's not like you see on um, some night vision goggles. It's more blurred because it's around the edge. So the photoreceptors um, can't pick up the, the detail as much. But it's much better, much better than ours. Because, you know, they're active at night. Predators are active at night. So they needed this eyesight that, can deal with daylight, it can deal with night, it has to be on average good in all these conditions, but not in massive changes or sudden changes to light and dark. They don't have that skill. This tapetum is the reflective bit that reflects our light back through the photosensitive cells in the eye, which gathers light and actually helps them to see light in, in more uh, detail. So, 
it, it's just there's just been some research about um, colors and things like that. And, you know, bright orange, which we see very clearly on jumps, um, has been shown to be pretty difficult for a horse galloping towards a fence to see. Actually, things like bright blue, white or, or fluorescent yellow are much clearer for the animal to be able to see the differences. Now, if you take then, if it's at dusk or twilight or in the dawn, bright light all of that color gets washed around and it's harder for them to see things in the same way that we would do essentially humans if they've got normal sight and can see um, clearly at 20 uh, feet they're considered to have 20 20 vision equines if we make some sort of comparison are considered to have 20 30 vision which means that what um, an equine can see clearly at 20 feet, we can see clearly at 30 feet. So our eyesight is better in those adjustments. But equines do better than uh, dogs, which are considered to have 20-50 vision. So again, what a dog can see clearly at 20 feet, we can see clearly at 50 feet. Um, cats, something around 20 to 75. Um, and rats are technically blind at like 20 to 200. But if you think about the different senses that animals use to hunt and survive, there's an account why rats don't need great vision because they actually live in the dark and cats use their ears to find their prey until the last tiny bit of the hunt. So equine's eyesight is really important, really uh, very much focused on their evolution but it has some factors that we should consider when it comes to uh, thinking about an equine centered trainer. So first we have to recognize that what they, we see isn't what they see. And it's very easy. Um, and I've got a, a question for you in a moment about this. Um, it's very easy just to presume we all see the same thing. And we clearly don't. Um, they're seeing the world totally different from, from us. Um, you know, puddles, depth perception, reflection of light, bright light, all of those things are going to affect what your donkey is seeing. There's challenges over bright light and shade. You know, you get your donkey and the vet comes, he's in the stable waiting for the vet, you bring him out onto the yard on a bright sunny day. Wow, that's quite hard for a donkey to adjust between the two. Or vice versa, you want to you take your donkey into the stable and do something. Again, these sudden changes are very difficult. So make them slowly anticipate ahead of time where that thing might need to happen, the handling, the training. And if, it, if there's a difference between light and dark, make an adjustment for that. Either keep them in the shade and train in the shade or allow them time to adapt to the other to the other condition you know i see this all the time people going into barns at night flip the switch on because we can't see anything and all the equines are like wow wow what, what happened there you know do we need to switch that light on can we use a red light in the barn so that everybody can see um if we do have to turn the light on let them know you're coming so that they can get used to the fact you're going to switch the light on and be prepared for it and secondly uh, give them time to adjust afterwards if before you do anything when you're doing your training and you're trying to get animals used to stuff, use color variations. Great to just go get your donkey over a tarpaulin or um, under some bunting, but use color variations. You know, if you want to take your donkey out for a walk on the road, those white lines are great, but the yellow ones maybe don't show up as clearly or red ones hardly show up at all. Or, you know, so there's these variations. And they change depending on the background, the light of the day. So as many variations in color are as important as you can make it. Um, allow them time to look. So don't restrict their head. You know, if you're going to hold your donkey's head here under the head collar, it, it's very difficult for it to turn its head. They need to turn their head to focus down on the ground, to move their binocular vision, to be able to lift their head and look at things. That's quite normal and important that they can do that. And that's absolutely fine to let them have their head to do that. Uh, think about the position of the sun when you're loading. Yeah, common mistake. You know, pull up with the trailer, right, we're going to load. And the sun is um, effectively in front of the trailer, shining into the donkey's eyes, but you're trying to get to load into a darker space. That's quite difficult for them to make that adjustment. Turn the trailer around, have the sun shining into the trailer, 
all of a sudden it's much easier for the donkey to deal with those uh, differences in light and shade. Uh, make sure you use movement in training. The eyes are really geared up for movement. Um, in my shaping plan for trust, problem solving and confidence, we do a lot of work with balloons. Um, just blowing them up, little tiny bit, let them go gradually bigger and rocket balloons and all sorts of crazy stuff. But the reason for that is not because some clown might jump out and attack your donkey with a balloon, but because you want your donkey to get used to that black bag that blows out across the, the behind them, the, the bird that jumps out the uh, hedge, the, we tie a plastic bag to the fence and let it move around while they're doing other things and training. So they're used to being able to take in movement, you know, don't be too static. At the right stage of training, we need to build these things in. Allow them to take the visual time for clues about depth. And remember, eyesight is likely to change with age. So younger donkeys, just like us, probably slightly better vision, it's likely cataracts and various eye conditions uh, and just general aging will affect the eyesight of your donkey. And think, could eyesight be problems be the cause of a behavior issue? Um, so often we see donkeys that you know, struggle to load or maybe they, they shy at things or they just, a little bit uncomfortable about moving out or going for a walk or leading and you watch them and, and shadows on the ground or a line on the ground that they struggle with may be an indication that they've got eyesight issues. So, you know, something you want every year when your vet does um, your MOT for your donkeys and vaccinations, try to get them to have a look in the eyes, make a good inspection of those eyes and see if there are any problems in, uh, in there. Um, Good. Okay. So that, that's about eyesight. And I know Jeff's asked, should, um, if donkeys like to sleep in the day and graze at dawn and dusk, should we keep them in the stable yard and only put them out in the field? Eh? And Not really. I think choice is the key. Again, we want, we'd want donkeys to have choice about how they can move and what they can do. But quite often, given a choice, that middle of the day is a natural sleepy time um, for donkeys or when they would choose to just rest. And quite often that's a good time if you want to do standing still and boarding training but it's not a great time if you want to do leading and walking training so maybe it's it's just about giving them choices and actually meeting some of their natural um needs good okay everybody's kind of with us so far fantastic okay so except there's a reason for everything they do even if you can't see it you know, so often I know people, oh, there's no reason. Quite often just a difference in vision is the reason a donkey behaves the way they do. Oh, this is a good one for the chat box. Who has better vision, men or women? Let's see what we come up with in our uh, chat box there. What do you think? Who's got the better vision? Humans, uh, men or human, women? Women, women, men, women women okay i'm guessing there's quite a few ladies on here so i don't know if there's a bias uh yeah but <laughs> depends if you're going to try and get us from point a to point b now we're going well, always women men can never find anything okay the reason i asked this question is not to to start some sort of war um is this is the challenge that we have as um humans is that the vision between men and women is different. Not better or worse, just different. So, you know, very quickly, things like women have more peripheral vision, generally. Um, I'm talking about evolution, generally better peripheral vision. Men tend to have more tunnel vision. Um, and I guess that's why a man, and I can say this because I'm a man, I go to the fridge and I look and I say, where's the butter? And uh, my wife says, it's in the fridge. And I'm like, can't see it. Uh, because it's off to one side, you know, I'm not suggesting that men can't learn to move their heads to see things, but that tunnel vision, we have this different vision. Women actually have better night vision than men, but because of spatial orientation abilities in the brain, quite often men can, if, like if ladies, if you feel driving at night can be a challenge. Sometimes it's about the, the oncoming car and the headlights, not being able to see which side of the road it's on. And is that a problem? greater peripheral vision you're taking in more light men tunnel vision they can see the spot past that car and, and and cope with it better so we've got this different uh vision men generally 
um, have less color receptors than women. That you know, most most likely, if someone's going to be colorblind, it'll be a man, not not a lady, um, because of um, where the chromosomes are carried for uh, color perception in the eye. But that tends to mean that like men have red, green, blue, yellow, you know, we have very primary colors. Ladies, you tend to have more color vision, more shade. And so you're sort of seeing a, a vast array of, of colors, you know, opal, aquamarine, taupe, bone meal, I don't, fuchsia. I'm just seeing red, blue, and green. And, and that, what I'm saying is it's hard enough to understand the differences in our own species and how we perceive something. And I'm asking you to think with the brain of a different animal. Uh, and that's a really important point that comes across to training. You know, up to this point, you probably, you know, you see the world, you expect everybody else to see the world as you do. That's not the case. Um, uh, there's all sorts of comments that I'm not even going into, uh, ladies and, and gentlemen. But um, is it important to choose specific color of buckets, feed and water? Not necessarily, because your donkeys can still see all of these things, it, but it might explain why sometimes they'll trip over a bucket or they'll walk over things. You know, when they see jumps, you know, there are certain color contrasts that are quite difficult to see. And you've only got to go on the internet and, and, and do a few searches, and there's plenty of pictures on there and plenty of examples of, of how vision might work or not work. And you can begin to think about that. But just look at your own donkeys. Are there particular things that they have an issue with? Um, you know, it's not that they can't see, it's just they see it differently. And that's the challenge. That's a challenge when we're dealing with our own species let alone uh, a different species. So I just throw that in there for you to just think about how difficult it is to understand a, a different species and, and how they might see or perceive something. Um, so let's, let's move on a little bit to another sense. Four centimeters squared. This is the size of the human phalanctry system. This blue area represents a small portion of the same phalanctry system in an equine, because actually in a horse and donkey, it's about a hundred times bigger. If you think about the size of their nose, if you think about um, how good their sense of smell is, we know that equines have a lot better sense of smell than us. However, what I will say is our sense of smell is a very powerful uh, emotional trigger. Have you ever smelt something and have a memory triggered from years before that you haven't thought about? Have you ever, if I blindfold you, take you to a hospital, would you know what sort of building you're in? And I suspect you probably would, because that sense of smell is next to the limbic system. You have a strong sense of smell, pair it with emotion, and later on in life, you can have that smell, trigger the emotion, and, and the memory comes with it. I just wanted to give you some sort of scale to think about how big this is. Is it any wonder your donkey can smell the vet before he gets out of the car? Um, <laughs> it is really powerful uh, sense that they use really well. But not only in terms of this, just to give you a scale again. So humans, um, I believe have five to six million sort of receptors in that area that are for um, smell. Bloodhounds, the top of the range for the dogs in terms of their ability to smell have something like 300 million sensors in their noses and equines cows things like that are thought to be somewhere in the middle it is incredibly powerful uh, a bloodhound's sense of smell is considered to be about ten thousand times better than ours so again you know i don't want you just thinking about donkeys but think about the dog and other animals in your life their perception of things is completely different from ours one of the things that we do is we talk about environment enrichment and uh, these donkeys have got some paprika uh, down on the ground for them to um, 
have a little smell and you can see how powerful that is but it's beyond scent because the donkeys also have a very important organ um and this organ um the jacobson's organ is a 12 couple of 12 centimeter tubes which is in the base of their uh, phalanchry system and it increases smell perception essentially volatile fatty acids body odor and you can see this donkey which is on hundreds of slides for the donkey sanctuary during a flame and response is what he's actually doing is sealing the nostrils you can just about see there to use those um, organs to get a better sense of smell of those volatile fatty acids body odors so they're talking about whether the animal what their reproductive state is um, things like their uh, reproductive state are they um, coming into season as what the animals have eaten this is why equines are obsessed with wee and poo and smelling it because there is so much information in there all undulates apart from us and the great apes really we don't have these organs thankfully could be rather embarrassing if we did but um they're there and they are massively important to the senses of the donkey and horse and mule so stallions especially but mares, any strong smell can produce this. It isn't just body uh, 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 acids. It can be, you know, ginger biscuits or something else that's a really strong smell that will trigger this response and they'll use it. But it's a really good indication that they're taking in a huge amount of information. Now, the other thing about smell, as I've got, alluded to, is it's a powerful link to behavior problems. This aversion and avoidance of situations or individuals and confusion, not to mention sexual behavior. So if you think about coming back to ourselves, sense of smell, limbic system, if you smell the vet, the farrier, whatever it might be, and you have a bad experience, there becomes a link between that smell and the person, the activity, the situation. Next time the vet turns up, for instance, um, and the vet might be really calm and nice, but injections or things they have to do is just painful. The animal smells that vet and immediately the system goes into preparation for fight or flight. And that is one of the problems uh, when we try to get our equines over barrier issues, vet issues, things like that, because most people don't do smell training. You, you can do all the training, you can pick up the feet, you can pretend to be the farrier, there can be two of you, you can do everything, the animal's perfect. Farrier turns up, no, I'm not having any of it. Because that sense of smell is what triggers the fear response. So one of the things that you start needing to do when you're dealing with these situations is add in the smell of the vet, the farrier. Um, and that might be by getting a t-shirt that they've been wearing and putting on the door when you're doing your training it might be asking them to wear a coat for a day that you can then take back in a, a long kind of stockman's coat that then you can use where you're feeding them and doing things to kind of condition the smell um, it might be about just using antiseptic on your hands at the right stage of training to begin to include that smell um, into the program very important often missed out and it's why often animals don't get over their fears be careful blowing up your donkey's nose because you don't know what you're telling them. Um, that's really important. Um, so be aware of your own perfume, soap, deodorants. You know, you suddenly start using a different perfume or soap that changes your body odor or you start using a tea tree or something like that and your donkey starts re re behaving differently to you. Um, they can smell the food in your pockets. Don't put food in your pockets. Put it in a bum bag if, you, if you're going to use food rewards. If you have it in your pockets, the animals can smell it. They can't tell when it is and isn't available and it can lead to problems. So keep it in a bum bag. You can take it on and off. The animals know when food isn't, and isn't available. Uh, generalization, use um, some training um, uh, to help add that fear in, um, that smell in when we get to later stages of training. Um, 
Mark asks, um, can they all smell, so smell human fear? It's a good question. Nobody's ever been able to prove that. It's probably highly likely, but again, it's highly likely. It's not just one thing. It's not just smell, it's body language, uh, uh, things like that that come into it as well. But it would be highly likely that they can smell some of the chemicals and they would make associations with experiences um, like that. Use their droppings to make uh, new areas familiar. So like if you're loading or you're introducing an animal to a new environment or you're mixing animals the first time, take and swap poo to different sides so that they get to smell all of that before the new animal comes in. If you've got problems with a vet and tharia, think about doing some smell training. Use smell and enrichment activities. Absolutely, you know, enrichment activity is really important. Include smell in there, not just always food, but smell. Put some lavender oil, some carrot oil around. Um, those sorts of things can be used really effectively. Allow them the time to sniff and to take in those clues about their environment and be aware of change of behavior on windy days. You're gonna be carrying more sense to the animal from greater distances, which will be more distracting. Um, once you use a powerful smell to disguise bitterness or, or things, it might be hard the second time because they're going to make that sense of smell is associated with a bit of taste and then they won't be tricked the second time. And again, except if there's any reason for anything they, they do, even if we can't smell it. Good. Here's a little um, resource for you. If you haven't already seen this, just search online for page tiger donkey enrichment as a, a a guide there to all sorts of different aspects of enrichment, including lots of different ideas um, and ways you can improve the enrichment for your donkeys. So um, Page Tiger Donkey Enrichment, Page Tiger is just the um, software that we use to make that, uh, but it's hugely um, beneficial resource there. Who's better at hearing, donkey or human? Answers in the chat box, who do you think? Donkey, 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 donkey. Everybody thinks donkey. Hmm. I always love this question because everybody gets it wrong, which is really interesting. We tend to think about hearing in terms of big ears, so it must be good at hearing. However, there are two measurements of hearing. And what we see here is the range of hearing in a human, 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, just over it, so 22, 23. That's low frequency sound dime with my little stick man and high frequency sound up here your donkey's hearing ranges from just under 55 hertz to about 33 and a half kilohertz so we hear different things we can hear lower frequency sounds than they can they can hear some higher frequency sounds than we can there is some speculation about vibration senses and things things called shoulder bounce that i'm not going to go into right now but there it's not that it's better or worse it's again it's just different it, just to give you an example again here's a lovely dog um and his hearing would be around 66 thousand kilohertz at the top of the range to hear the highest note a dog can hear you're going to add 48 keys to the right hand side of a piano why do dogs need to hear that high? Because their ancestors hunt little squeaky things under snow. So really important. It's different again from us. But there's another factor involving hearing, and that's about detection of where that sound came from. The interesting thing here is that donkeys are not very good at it compared to humans. Humans can detect sounds from about one degree. So you hear a sound, if you've got equal hearing in both ears, it's very easy to pinpoint where that sound came from. And that's based around um, a little piece of the brain, which is quite developed in humans, which measures the difference in speed between the sound reaching one ear and another ear. And donkeys tend to be able to locate sound within a degree of about 25 to 30 degrees, it's quite wide. And if you think again about evolution, it makes sense. As a human, I, I've evolved in a multi-layered environment, things above me, below me, all around me. Pinpointing sound is important. However, a donkey flight mechanism, I just need to know there's a scary sound over in that direction, I'm gonna run that way. I don't need to know exactly where that is, I just need to know that way. Now you're gonna say, yes, but they can move their ears. And I'm gonna say, yeah, but half the time, their ears are facing the wrong way and aren't gonna pick up sound as well. Those ears, remember, are for calling 
blood in hot climates, not for hearing things fantastically well. So when a donkey is out walking and it hears a twig snap in the woods, that donkey might spook a little bit because it can't pinpoint the sound. They'll want to turn and look at it. They want to put both ears on it. Whereas you could walk and go, yeah, it's over there. So we see these differences again between the donkey and the human and understanding them. They might live next to a train line and not ever lift their head when a train goes past because it's slow, it's steady, it builds up from a distance. But I would say, ladies, if you were walking down uh, the high street uh, three o'clock in the morning um, and you heard a twig snap behind you, you would probably spook too in the same way a donkey might. Excuse me just a second. So how can we be more donkey-centered training with hearing? Again, be aware donkeys can hear things you can't, so trust them. Tone of voice. A lot of people talk about tone, talking to your donkey. The, the range of human voice does come in a range that donkeys can hear. However, it's been shown really that tone of voice doesn't really affect their ability to learn from us, but it does change our body language, which is probably what they're watching and is more important to them than tone of voice. Slightly different for dogs. Dogs' tone of voice can really affect their behavior. But um, with equines, tone of voice changes our body language, which changes the, the donkey's perception of us. Again, generalization. You sound. Noisy things. CDs with music on. Um, firework CDs. Things that make noise when you walk on them. Don't be too careful. At the right stage of training, bring in these things so that animals get used to that. Think about the sound element of obstacles. Like you're teaching your donkey to load, it's going to walk across a tra trailer ramp, and that's a hollow sound. Now, donkeys have evolved not to stand on hollow things because you fall through. So you're training them with a pallet, with a safe top on, so they get used to walking and hearing that sound will help them if they've got to cross a bridge. It will help them if they've got drains under the road that they've got to walk over. Allow them to pinpoint sound by turning around to face the noise. Be aware of the changes in behavior on windy days. Again, on windy days, more sounds are being carried to your donkey, but also more sounds are being taken around and swirled up and missed, mixed up by the noise of the wind. So it's harder for them to hear. So they, they tend to focus more and it's, it's harder to get them to focus on you on a windy day. Except there's reason for everything uh, they do, even if you can't hear it. Hopefully you're beginning to see a little uh, pattern uh, with all of these things now. Um, I heard equines can hear your heartbeat from some distance away, which is when you're nervous, they know it. It's a, it's a good question. Uh, I can hear my own heartbeat. Um, and so I'm guessing uh, equine hearing might be able to do that. Um, Although a heartbeat is kind of a lower frequency sound. So I'm not sure that's been proved. It would be a useful piece of science for someone to do. Um, but I, I'm not sure. There's, I've not read any scientific evidence on that. Okay, sense of touch. Parts of the body vary in sensitivity. Withers, mouth, flank, elbow regions, most sensitive. Why? Because when equines are rubbing alongside each other, when they run, when they... Are together in a herd it's important to have that sense of each other how close they are the movement the pressure the changes um, in pressure between animals that are in a herd and moving um, and so that's where that sensitivity there are other areas that are less sensitive obviously just like in humans particularly sensitive as is the mouth area and we'll look at that briefly in a moment this has some implications if you're harnessing your donkey and we're coming back to that webinar at the end of the month to look at the harness how it fits if your tack doesn't fit properly it will cause discomfort but like all pain receptors in the skin the more they're stimulated they become less reactive so if you've got badly fitting tack your animal might react to that initially but then as the ride or walk or whatever you're doing progresses, the reaction will be less because they're becoming less sensitized to it. Doesn't mean to say it isn't just as uncomfortable and it isn't rubbing. It's um, just showing that there could be um, a problem that's not being picked up on. And they have a panicular response to uh, flies, which, um, 
is the bit where you put fly spray on a donkey or a fly lands on the donkey and they go, Whoo, and they shake, they trip. It's an automatic reflex. We can't do it. It's there to get rid of flies. That's how light their sense of touch is. So be aware of that. That's why when you put fly spray on, it's like, ooh, 100,000 flies landing on them all at once. Very sensitive to touch. It's been shown that things like the side of a, of a horse is um, more sensitive than the human fingertip. It's important just to realize, again, they're just experiencing a different world from us. Um, this sense of touch is, is essential for bonding and social grooming. So that allo grooming, when they groom each other on the neck and the flank and, and the withers, really important as part of their bonding, uh, tends to be started by lower ranking individuals and finished by higher ranking individuals. Um, foals do a lot of um, asking for social grooming. It's a, it's a very strong, so it lowers heart rate and is, and is very powerful. Um, the other aspect about this is exploration using the mouth and whiskers. Lovely little picture of a foal here, just exploring this. The mouth is incredibly sensitive. If you, if you think about how you will see your equine kind of take a bite of something and manage to manipulate out a bit of root or a bit of soil or a bit of stone that it's managed to pick up. You very rarely see equines ingesting foreign objects like you do cows. Uh, doing that because their mouth is so sensitive to all of those things and the whiskers are incredibly important they are part of the animal sensory system they are there for a reason they position tell the animal the position of their head in space in relation to the floor and when they're touching things and um, mutually grooming and doing all that in mice every whisker has a separate area of the brain and which gives it information about its world because the whiskers are so important for an uh, for a mouse for an equine, really important. They are a vital sense of touch. Um, and that's really important to, to grasp as well. They're using those all of the time to get information about um, their environment. If we talk about touch, how can we apply that? Um, so again, beware, donkeys can feel things that you can't. So we have to trust them with their behavior when they're telling us something's wrong. Mimic aloe grooming, not pats if you want your donkey to enjoy touch. You know, two donkeys never patted each other in all your life. They groom each other physically on the withers, the neck, maybe shoulder and along the back in the most common areas um, for grooming. And if we can give really hard physical scratches in those areas, we can in some way stimulate that response. And that's where you see them trembling their lip and moving their lip because we're triggering those same responses when we do that. Pat doesn't do that for them. Um, I don't know why we use pats. I think it's something to do with the sound that we get from them. But actually, uh, it's not something that equines do. It's not something they relate to. I think it's something they learn to tolerate from us. So we can use wither scratches as rewards, lowers heart rates, but they'll work for it because they enjoy it so much. Uh, make sure your tack fits correctly. Get it checked and fitted to each animal. Don't trim the whiskers. They are part of the animal's sensory system, especially not for cosmetic purposes. In some countries, it's actually outlawed um, because it's considered so important to the animal. So just leave those whiskers on there um, and, and accept them um, and enjoy them. You may have to train your donkey to accept fly spray quite laterally. A lot of donkeys don't like it and you may have to go through a shaping plan to get over that. Respect the oral sensitivity in equines and avoid heavy handedness in the mouth or nose. You know, it comes back to a little bit of our question early on about bitting or bitless bridles. It's an incredibly sensitive area. Um, don't underestimate how sensitive that is. So think carefully about how you train your animals, what equipment you use, and how you can make sure that you don't have to haul on the head or the nose um, and cause physical discomfort and pain. Uh, don't put your thumb across the bulb of the heel where you're picking up the feet. Often donkeys don't like that. It's a very ticklish, sensitive area. Um, and quite often, especially donkeys that uh, are new to having their feet picked out on a regular basis will be very ticklish and kick out just because you are got your thumb on that area. And accept there's a reason for uh, everything that they do, even if we can't feel it. Let me just check here for a moment if there are any new uh, questions. Uh, as is a visual difference between men and women, are female donkeys' eyes different to male donkeys? Absolutely no idea, Gene, unfortunately. I say there isn't enough research on that. There is some evidence 
about male horses and visual perception and speed and movement um, and that potentially male you see a lot of male horses at the higher level of sport because of their um, presumed perception about uh, speed and depth and those sorts of things compared to females so there is potentially but there's no evidence to uh, say that there is um does it help to join in their sense of touch mimic what they are doing will they see you as part of their herd mm, uh, susie no they won't see you as part of their their herd um they'll see you as a human who is trying to communicate with them and um that's a really good thing um we're not trying to be another donkey uh, we are trying to make a connection and have this interspecies communication and if we can mimic what they know and what they're used to it makes it easier for them to appreciate it and understand what we're trying to do but we're we're not trying to be part of their herd or or that sort of thing um good uh wendy will come back to your question on the uh, any tips for the daily use of the inhaler the mouth being so sensitive how can we make the houseman's gang be introduced in order to do things. yep again judith so we talk about the houseman's gag which is um a gag that we put in to open the donkey's mouth to do um really good quality dentals make sure we can see all the teeth again it's about training it's about preparing your donkey getting used to the difference with um, rubber gloves with having fingers in their mouth with with gently being handled being rewarded for that behavior uh, maybe taking a wooden spoon with some honey on it getting in like that um, teaching the donkey just to open their mouth when you put your hand in the side um, and actually having a really good equine dental technician or vet that takes their time and, and goes slowly in what they do um, it's amazing what donkeys can uh, tolerate and work with and understand and for the benefits that good dental brings it's worth doing that training and although i doubt the donkeys think yippee it's the dentist i love it uh, no more than humans do it's so beneficial to them that it, it's worth uh doing um yeah they they do seem to like a peppermint smell they like all sorts of smells carrot oil and and they they are very um sensitive to smell and uh that's why we use it in enrichment and we i'll give you a share with you a little um bit of a resource on how we can use medications and smells and things like that as well so just moving on finally to taste um now we don't know as much about taste um, in equines as we do in um other senses we know that foals have been shown to prefer sweet water compared to plain water they've shown a preference their tolerance uh, equines in general for bitter or sour flavors is greater than humans so they can really tolerate a lot more bitterness than we can and they seem to have some sort of salt receptors in their tongues potentially so they can tell how much salt is in their diet which is why you might get them to lick their mineral lick and then they don't touch it for days and you'll see this in in wild uh, mustangs or brumbies or burrows you know they quite often go to a, a mineral resource they'll lick the soil they take on some minerals and then they won't go back for a week two weeks three weeks depending on on a number of factors so there seems to be some sense in the equines of when that is important and i've just made a mention here of self-selection and detection of toxic plants often people say well you know they're, they're really good with a sense of taste they'll know that a plant's bitter and they shouldn't eat it first of all they can tolerate a lot of bitterness and secondly if a in evolution if they grew up with their mother smelling the plants that she was eating from her breath or in the feces they learn what to eat and what not to eat in modern domestication we move animals all over the place and they're exposed to plants that they never would have picked up on in their youth so there is a danger from poisonous plants and we would advocate that you always remove poisonous plants from their environment all the time there's, there's no real question about that don't take the risk um so yeah how can we be more donkey centered with our taste be a way that donkeys can taste things that you can't remove poisonous plants provide salt and mineral licks so the two i would probably separate the two out a salt licks pure salt and a mineral lick so they can make choices of which they want to use 
uh, for using food rewards, check your animal's preferences. So again, you can put a number of different food rewards on the yard to see which one they pick up first, which one they seem to go for. Although uh, they like them, limit and avoid sugary treats. I think that's for all of us, to be fair, but definitely limit them for your equines. Respect the oral sensitivity of equines. Avoid that heavy handedness on the mouth. You know, it, it's, it's teach lightness. Stay out of that mouth for as long as you possibly can. Keep that lightness. Don't haul around. Teach them to deal with things so that they don't have to panic and pull on the, the bridle or the bit or the bitless head, or the head collar, whatever it might be. If you're struggling with medications, visit um, this particular document that's created. It's all about getting medications in. Um, and there's lots of different ideas of how you can get medications into your donkeys in that one. And accept there's everything, uh, a reason for everything they do, um, even if we can't taste it. So it's, a, it's an important thing that comes into that we, again, just don't necessarily think about. The last two uh, sections I just want to touch on here are the brain um, and how donkeys think and learn and their memory. So these are the questions that we roughly need to answer for you. How smart is a donkey? And can we measure equine intelligence? So the donkey century did do a trial. And actually, uh, donkeys and mules came out above horses and in some cases dogs in some spatial awareness tests um, and showed they were quite smart at problem solving. However, I've always believed it's difficult to measure intelligence for a number of reasons. One, we make the intelligence tests, so therefore we are always biased. Secondly, the things that we think might be important to an equine and motivate them may not motivate equines. So, for instance, there are some well-documented experiments where um, fat animals are not as intelligent as thin ones. Uh, ultimately, what was really happening was the thin animals were working harder to get their food. Fat animals kind of went, oh, I don't need that so much. I don't feel uh, you know, like I need to eat. I'm not as hungry. And so they stopped the test early and didn't do so well. So depending on the animal's previous experiences, has it had a lot of negative reinforcement punishment? Has it had a lot of positive reinforcement? Will determine how well it does intelligence tests. I think the key thing is to say donkeys are really good at being donkeys. You know, uh, any measure, they're really good at learning. They're good at these things like learning to learn, I'll explain, but they're just really good at being a donkey. And so where they fit on the scale, how intelligent is not something that really interests me. How good are they at maze tests? Um, not great, to be honest. This is where they have uh, different choices and they can go left and right and, and find either a food reward or an exit to, to food. And uh, they learn how to do it. Um, and then they decide to choose the other side. And that always confuses the scientists because it's like, well, you should know which way to go, so you always go that way. But equines are really smart. Just because this has always worked one way doesn't mean to say that now that hasn't a better answer might be on the other side. So if you think about it, you graze an area out when you're in a herd in the wild and then you move on to another area. If you went, well, there's no grass in the other area because we ate it all, you'd never go back and see. So equines learn to go back and check and do other things. We humans, we tend to be a little bit more staid. We try something, it works or it doesn't, and then we stay with the thing that works. And it's not so advantageous to equine. So that's why you'll be doing something. You think you've got them over a problem and then they'll try something else or they'll go back and revert and ask the old question again or do the old behavior. It's completely normal behavior. doesn't mean that they're anything other than a donkey. So just be aware of, of that. Problems of reversal. Donkeys, equines in general, do struggle when you change things. They learn something and then you change what's required but so do humans, I guess. Um, so uh, the classic experiment for this is, is they have four doors with food behind, three are locked, one is open. They let the uh, equine go, they push the door, get the food, great. Once they learn that really quickly, they then lock that door and open a different one. For some equines, they can push that locked door a hundred times before they might go and try another one. And they go and find another one and then they lock the next one and maybe they'll push that one 50 times. And then the second one, will be locked and then move it again and then it'll be 25 times and pretty soon they learn whenever there's a locked door they try a different door and that's where it comes into learning to learn but i want to say you know problems of reversal if you're in a sanctuary you give your donkey medication every day for three weeks in a sandwich and then it's the end of their medication 
you've just reversed the problem. Now they still want their sandwich. They still want to get in for their extra food. They're still doing all that crazy thing because that's what's always worked. But now we've reversed the problem and say, no, we don't want you to do that. So that's where you see behaviors that sometimes can feel like they're infuriating, but it's because we've reversed the problem. Donkeys are really good at learning to learn. So the more you do, the more they learn and the faster they get at learning. Um, I once had a donkey here that um, we talked to roll out a red carpet amongst a, a lot of other things. And um, it took him about 35 minutes in total over seven sessions to learn to do that because he'd already learned how to solve a number of other problems. He was really good at learning to learn and his learning got quicker and quicker and quicker. So the more you do, the more your animal will learn to do. Learning is easiest when it's closest to the animal's normal or natural behavior patterns. There's almost nothing that we do with an equine that's close to their normal and natural patterns. And that's why it's difficult for them to learn. You know, what they do in the wild, they don't have a problem picking up their feet. They don't have a problem loading. They don't have a problem leading. They don't have a problem with anything that we want to do because they're not natural behaviors. So the heart, the further it is from simple things the harder it is for them to learn um, and that's quite a difficult thing because we see lots of donkeys that can pick up their feet and so we think all donkeys can do it but it's a really challenging situation for a donkey to learn and obviously as you all know previous experience affects learning uh, whatever's gone in their past will create neural pathways in their brain which then begins to affect how they think and act in the future so to become a more donkey-centered trainer with learning what we have to do is to uh, set the donkey up to succeed. Take small steps, shape the behavior, reward the try. Really small steps. It's crucial because that's what makes learning easy for them. Donkeys learn at different rates. Don't compare them or force them. Um, the speed of learning because one donkey learned really fast and another donkey is taking more time. You know, I see this with clicker training a lot. One donkey will pick it up in two or three sessions. Another donkey, because of its personality, will take five or six sessions to, to really get into it. Um, then they're not better or worse. They're just different. Uh, use wither scratches as rewards. Really powerful. Um, they will work for them. Use enrichment to help exercise their brain's memory and location mapping. It's been shown that the more enriched the environment, uh, the better the donkeys are at learning, the less anxious they are um, because they're using their brains more. Uh, recognize that the more they learn the faster they get learning so the more you can do with your donkey the more you, problems you can set the more challenges the more learning the better they get at it uh, make things normal and uh, natural be patient with more complicated behaviors like picking up feet leading loading and grooming and all that sort of thing because they're not natural behaviors so it takes time be consistent expect some to break down when you change routines so when you do something different when you suddenly move from where you normally do the farrier to somewhere else where you suddenly change the routine um, expect there be some breakdown in that behavior you must do the generalization um, phase of training so you one place one thing when you start to then create more options well it's the same thing if we pick up your feet over there if we pick them up your feet over there if we pick it up over there if he picks up your feet if they pick up your feet if we do it this way if we do it the wrong way the more you do of that the faster they get learning all picking up feet is the same important to do that generalization phase and accept everything there's a reason for what they do even if we can't understand it just to mention old donkeys and new tricks this donkey was about 17 when he started um to learn this trick um, he was a stallion came into the sanctuary jack mcquilton and um yeah quite capable older donkeys take a, often a little bit longer to get going because of previous experiences and maybe not been encouraged to learn and offer behaviors but they're more than capable of learning new behaviors and, and moving on finally i just wanted to touch about memory so short-term memory eight to 60 seconds of retention. It varies between animals as a simple test. Put your animal on a line, three buckets, put food in one of the buckets, mass the scent of the food um, in all the buckets so the animal can't use scent to choose, and then wait on that line and then release them and see how well they do at going and finding the food in the bucket. Um, some donkeys, uh, some horses, sorry, in this case, some horses uh, do no better than chance after eight seconds. Now, that might be because they're not motivated by food or they've got really bad short-term memory. 
Uh, others can wait 60 seconds or more and still get the right bucket. A lot of variation, same as us. Have you ever done that thing where you want to remember a number and you go, oh, seven, nine, three, seven, one, seven, one, three, seven, oh, one, three, and you walk like five feet, you go to pick up the phone and you go, oh, one, ah, oh, what was it? And you've forgotten. Memory retention. Um, that's to do with the number of slots in our brain and, and short-term memory slots that fall apart. Which is why when someone gives you a long number, like your mobile phone number, anybody done that? You ring, get a mobile phone number, what's your number? And you give it to them in a pattern, you know, 317-912-2141. And there's a pattern that you put it together. And if they read it back in the wrong pattern, you're like, oh, is that my number? Because it's the pattern that's in your memory bank, not necessarily just the numbers. So short-term memory, really important that's why timing is so important um, we need to make sure that whatever we do it's as close to the behavior as possible so that we avoid any short-term uh, confusion over what the animal is just being reinforced for long-term memory so they um, had 20 pairs of pattern cards the horse learned all 20, donkey learned 13, zebra learned 10. Now don't read anything into that. It's not about intelligence, previous experience, all sorts of things. They retested at one, three, six, and 12 months. And there was a 77% retention of the pairs in the horse memory. So after 12 months, they remembered 15 of the 20 pairs of cards. Now I would suggest that most of us would struggle to remember the different pairs because these weren't similar pairs they were a circle that was matched with a triangle and a, and a club shape was matched with a diamond and after 12 months they could remember 15 of those pairs similar tests that actually rose to about 85 percent um, retention after 12 months which is really really good so they've got very good long-term memory um, i have seen personally two donkeys that were at the sanctuary um, we had some um, animal welfare inspectors who were all a whole group of 20 of them all dressed the same in their uniforms the only difference was their face and their smell i guess and there was a lady there who worked with two donkeys from a large group two years previously and she had not seen those donkeys in two years she went to the gate and the fence they all stood there those donkeys came straight from the back of the group came straight to her you know, in my mind, there was no doubt that they recognized that. And there's lots of evidence that equines, sheep, cows have got very good long-term memory. That has a massive effect on how we train. Timing is important. We have to get our timing right. The, the moment the behavior is, is occurring is when we want to reinforce the behavior if we want to get the best communication. Donkeys have these long-term memories, so how you treat or train them will influence their behavior for a long time. It's a really powerful message. Doesn't mean to say if your donkey's had a bad start, they can't get over it. That's bad start is with somebody else. How you treat them now is different, but it does mean that it takes a while just for them to begin to trust you, and that's a slightly different matter we've talked about in other webinars. Don't get out of patience, they will remember. And that breaks the consistency rule and that causes problems. Using enrichment to help exercise their brains, memory, location mapping again. I can't overstate this. Really try and get some enrichment into your environment, some different activities, smell, location, hiding things. That resource is there, lots of examples. If you think uh, they forgot something, it probably means you taught them something else than you intended. You know, they've got good memory, especially over short term that, you know, they're not going to forget from one day to the next if you've done it well and you've taught them. Small, short lessons so that the clarity of the learning means that they know exactly what it was that you wanted. They're smart enough to chain behaviors together. Um, this is the thing where they start to predict that if one thing leads to another the pre uh, principle but also that if you they come up they nudge you and then they stand still you give them a scratch for standing still but they've worked out that the pattern and how it chains together is i nudge you first then i offer standing still that's how i get attention and they will chain behaviors together very well and they know that when you um, go into the feed store um, what's coming and they start to get excited because the anticipation is there all of this memory is there everything that we do with them is about behavior they're very good at learning if you're very good at teaching and their senses are triggers uh, for behavior so include them in the training remember all the way through we've talked about how we include their senses in in the training 
and let's accept there's a reason for everything they do, even if we can't remember it. So thinking with the, the donkey's brain, I just wanted to say, putting all this information together, it allows us to think with their brain. Now, this is different than thinking with our brain through their eyes. It's about understanding how they view the world and how they think with their brain, not ours. And that leads just finally to anthropomorphism, which is where we give equines human emotions. And there's a big discussion about this. You know, some people are like, no, you must never. Other people are like, oh, totally, they have this. And I think it's, for me, it's somewhere in the middle that we have to be aware when we're using anthropomorphism. Because anthropomorphism, saying that he is um, jealous or that he's naughty or that he's cheeky, those are human emotions. And when we give them to equines, it changes the way we work with them and how we might perceive their behavior and what they do. So it's important that we are aware of this anthropomorphism, that we step back from it, especially when it's got negative connotations, um, and that we um, don't give them human emotions because sometimes human emotions aren't very good. They're not very pleasant. And actually, equines have much better senses of what they're doing. So just be aware of that anthropomorphism backing off a little bit viewing the donkey as they see their world and this is a lot about exploring take some video of your donkey doing things watch your donkey more see how they perceive the different challenges that they are encountering on a daily basis and that's how you begin to think with your donkey's brain every donkey is a unique individual different circumstances different environment it changes with age um, and you need to just be constantly thinking about how your individual animals, and it's harder if you've got five or six animals than it is if you've got two, but it's important that you begin to think with those animals' brains rather than your own.